learners i am dr munish kumar bhardwaj from school of engineering and technology as you know we have discussed till now the defects in buildings where we discuss about the defects in timber in steel and in sanitary fittings and plumbing later on we discuss repairing materials for defects in timber also in steel as well as in sanitary fittings and plumbing also we discuss about the repairing materials for miscellaneous defects later on we discuss about repairing of floors and then we discuss about the strengthening of stone and masonry structures now we are moving to damp proofing and waterproofing in today's lecture we will discuss about damp proofing science of dampness its detection causes of dampness prevention of dampness and remedial measures the objectives of this module are that at the end of this module you should be able to explain the methods of detection of dampness also you should be able to find the causes for dampness you should be able to describe the methods adopted for prevention of dampness and you should also be able to explain various remedial measures to deal with the dampness in a structure so let us first begin with the definition of dampness you know that moisture may be present in the air or on the surface or it may diffuse through solids into the material any indication of slight wetness or moisture is termed as dampness building materials such as bricks concrete plaster timber etc have a moisture content which under normal circumstances is no cause of concern the rise in moisture content of these materials to a level where it becomes visible or when it causes deterioration is the real dampness dampness and water leakages in buildings are serious concern for civil engineers all over the world in spite of proper supervision during construction buildings are still affected by these problems principles of damp proofing most of the building materials used in construction are exposed to water and are not impervious and they allow water to enter into their systems sometimes the building materials may be good but the bonding material like mortar may be pervious and may permit water inside cracks occur due to expansion and shrinkage of construction material which in turn form voids which allow water to pass through thus the basic principle involved to prevent dampness is to make construction materials void free and avoid void formation after the construction this is the basic principle if porous materials are unavoidable they have to be made impervious with materials in the pore filling class means select the material from the pore filling class or you may cover it completely with impervious layers to repel water the pore filling materials fill in voids expand because of chemical reactions and thus ensure water tightness now let's see procedure for damp proofing what are different steps first of all what we have to do we have to identify the source of dampness after identifying this we have to look that if if any hydro static pressure is involved including uplift pressure measures to counter this pressure are to be adopted the most common construction material concrete must be fully compacted while casting because if it is not fully comp compacted then there will be voids in the concrete now decide whether waterproofing is to be on the positive side or the positive face means water face or on opposite side depending upon the construction detail because you can do that waterproofing on either face so the decision has to be taken 
depending upon the construction detail. Decide about the waterproofing system, which system you want to follow. Either you want to follow the pore filling method or you want to use the repellent. Now follow instructions by the manufacturer in respect of specific materials or systems used. If you are using some specific material or new material, then follow the instructions by the manufacturer. Now how we know that there is dampness? So what are the signs of dampness? In case of dampness, it is very important to maintain a complete record from the period when it is first noticed. That's whenever you notice that there is some dampness, so have a complete record of it. If it can be established that the occurrence of dampness is related to temperature or weather, this can help significantly in limiting the possible causes of the trouble. Signs of dampness which are directly evident are number one stains on different surfaces of building. If dampness is there, you may see stains. Second one is visible water such as a film moisture or drops of water on the surface. Also dampness can be identified by bad smell, formation of mold, insects, salts and other corrosion products also testify to the presence of the dampness. Detachment and falling of paint film, wallpaper, plaster, timber, ceiling plaster are indicative signs of dampness. Displacement of parapets, wall tiles, floor tiles and cracking of glass walls also take place due to the dampness. Now how you will detect dampness? So for detecting the dampness, what we have to do? There is no limit to the size of dampness stain. It can be of any size from a smaller to the larger one. One of the ways of telling whether a dampness stain is still active is to remove any growth of mold or efflorescence after a record has been made of the condition. Means if you have recorded that what is the present condition then you can identify whether it is active or not and to see how much it returns before the next inspection. We can do that identification. This way it can sometimes be determined whether the dampness is increasing or decreasing. That you first identify the existing one, make a record of it, then remove it, then see whether it is coming again or identify the size of it and see later on that whether it is increasing or decreasing. So that way you can detect the dampness whether it is active or not. Similarly it can be useful to draw a pencil line around the outline of the dampness stain and to date it. That when you have marked that portion by pencil, so you write the date also so that you can easily assess that whether after that particular date, after how many days, how much there is increase or decrease in that stain. The size of a stain depends on the material behind the surface. So that size of the stain will also depend on the material used. The shape of a stain is not only informative but also be conclusive. How the crescent shape in the corner of a surface is conclusive evidence of condensation while the convex shape of a stain indicates that the source of water is other than the condensation. So that way the shape of a stain also tells about the source. Now what are the causes of dampness? Dampness in building is generally due to bad design, faulty construction and or poor materials used in construction. Structures built on high ground and well drained soil are far less liable to suffer from foundation dampness than those built on low lying waterlogged areas where a subsoil of clay or 
peat is commonly found because through these dampness will inevitably rise unless properly treated a subsoil through which water can easily pass such as firm gravel sandy soil or a soil containing light clay will usually keep the foundation fairly dry because water will percolate through the, this type of soil to the down in coastal towns walls are particularly prone to seepage because of high humidity and salt particles in the atmosphere since uh, salt absorbs water the walls become damp when it happens the plaster peels off exposing the steel reinforcement in course of time the steel is corroded further weakening of structure happens there the sand mixed with cement for the reinforced concrete is also sometimes salt contaminated and it endangers the life of the structures leaks generally occur from the sanitary fittings in new constructions leaks are due to inadequate curing of concrete and also due to the use of sub standard quality of the concrete various causes for dampness are condensation rain penetration built in water pipe leakage spillage seepage rising dampness and finally hygroscopic salts if these are present then it is building is bound to witness the dampness now let's see condensation it indicates the deposition of moisture from the atmosphere either internal or external on relatively cold surfaces internal air should be allowed to circulate by providing proper ventilation especially in closed rooms so that way you can safeguard the structure from dampness then next is rain penetration penetration of rain water in structure takes place due to uses of defective materials faulty designs or construction techniques if construction techniques is faulty then rain water will penetrate all constructional defects allowing penetration of rain water in any part of the structure should be immediately rectified the building should be dried thereafter by natural ventilation by keeping the windows open or by using suitable heaters dehumidifiers may be used keeping the windows closed fast drying methods which affect timber joints plaster paint and wallpapers etc should be avoided now let's see built in water what is this it is the presence of water which has been enclosed within the structure during the construction process such as water used in mixing concrete mortar plaster water from atmosphere like rain snow frost and dew large quantities of water used during construction evaporate into the internal layer of the building and become available for condensation in unoccupied new buildings this effect is felt more because it is closed there is no circulation of air the problem may however disappear completely within 2 years except in the case of water and trap within the roof of the structure the remedy lies in drying out the affected area of the building and providing good ventilation next we see the pipe leakage leakage from a water supply line or rain water pipes or a drainage system if not attended to in time proves to be an effective source of dampness such leakages should immediately be repaired and water collecting near the fault point drained off next is spillage the spillage of water from industrial and domestic activities is an active source of dampness to check spillage of water remedial measures like the provision of proper drainage should be ensured next is rising dampness it is caused by slow rise of water from the ground up into the wall or floor due to defective or missing damp proofing cores or treatment in such cases new damp proof core should replace the old one or 
building chemicals available in the market may be grouted or injected to form a preventive layer. Next is hygroscopic salts. Hygroscopic salts assist in moisture migration and cause deterioration of the construction materials. In porous construction materials, excess water accelerates the reaction. Excessive wetting of construction materials should therefore be avoided. Care should be taken to ensure that factors responsible for it are checked in advance. All kinds of dampness due to salt should be dealt with by removing the stained plaster. Affected mortar joints should be raked and redone properly with waterproofing activity where required. Dampness associated with hygroscopic salts can be attributed to the following. These are the factors. Contaminated sand or gravel. Presence of salt contaminated sand or gravel in mortar and concrete mixes. And calcium chloride. The presence of calcium chloride used as quick setting agent in concrete or mortar mixes. Composition of floor. Magnesium oxychloride in floors which have broken down into the chlorides. Then industrial contamination. The presence of salts from industrial processes. Then animal contamination. The presence of salts from animal waste either in stables or indirectly from leaky drains. Then flooding. Large deposits of silt and mud containing salts brought by floods. Now we move to prevention of dampness. Planning and design stage. Careful consideration is required to study the various causes that lead to dampness and waterproofing problems at the planning and design stage itself. What are the different levels or stages? First is site investigation. Preliminary investigation is necessary to fix the underground water table level. Since this aspect determines whether any waterproofing treatment is required or not for the basement floor. After investigation, the plinth level of the building should be fixed such that it is well above the adjoining areas and surface water level. As far as possible, the basement should be avoided if the subsoil water level is high. If it cannot be avoided, the subsoil water level should be lowered. Design in RCC. In RCC work, the designer must ensure avoiding of shrinkage cracks. Then congestion of reinforcement leads to corrosion because of voids and consequent absorption of water. Because if congestion of reinforcement is there, proper compaction of concrete will not be there. So there will be a, there is a possibility of voids formation in the concrete. So impermeable concrete should be specified when the members are in contact with water and the designer should take the uplift pressure from the subsoil into consideration. It is very important. Next construction stage, quality of workmanship, very important thing. The materials used in construction such as stone aggregate and sand should be free from defects. The quality of workmanship in masonry, concreting, plastering, etc. should be well controlled and supervised. Water stops. Special attention is required in respect of water stops provided in RCC members. Joints should be perfect. It is preferable to do the fabrication on ground and then erect it at the site before concreting. Voids in materials. When different materials are involved like uh, concrete and brickwork, brickwork and wood etc. There are possibilities of voids being created due to reasons like thermal expansion, variation in environmental conditions, stresses, deflection etc. Once voids are formed, a path of least resistance for the passage of water will result. Water entering through the voids corrode the reinforcement and further deterioration of concrete takes place. Expansion or contraction joints. The basic approach required is to form proper bond to ensure void free joints and junctions. 
in case of construction joints the standard specifications of cleaning the surface and providing a layer of rich cement slurry before laying fresh concrete should be strictly followed in the case of expansion joints there should be cover over the joint location and the gap filled up with proper sealants now we move to remedial measures and treatment the cure for dampness depends on the correct diagnosis an experienced and knowledgeable person can easily identify the cause and suggest suitable remedial measures treatment of foundation on poor soils where the subsoil water is not properly drained like in situation of clay or peat soil the structure should be disconnected from the face of the ground excavation and a trench made all around for a width of about 60 cm taken down to a point at least as low as the underside of the concrete footing so if you can do that you can ensure that dampness will not enter into the building the bed of the trench should be provided with a good slope at each end and the trench filled with coke gravel or stone graded with fines to fill the voids an open jointed land drain may be laid at the bottom to collect and drain out the subsoil water a waterproof coat should be given outside the structure foundation on the external face of the wall and continued through the thickness of wall under the wall over the foundation concrete and also under the floor a 75 mm layer of waterproofed cement concrete can be laid all around dampness can also sometimes be reduced by leaving out an air gap around the external wall of the foundations where the subsoil water is near the ground surface and cannot be lowered by underground drainage owing to the flatness of the ground or any other reason the height of the plinth should be capped sufficiently high next is damp proof coats one of the following specifications may be adopted for a damp proof coats according to the type of construction and the nature of the ground two courses of dense bricks in 1 is to 3 cement mortar brick should have a water absorption of not more than 40% it is advantageous to leave the vertical joints unfilled as moisture rises through the mortar joints a layer of well burnt brick soaked in hot tar and pitch will suit for low cost buildings non porous stone slab 50 mm thick laid for the full width of the wall over a bed of cement mortar two layers of non porous slates laid to break joint each layer being bedded and set solidly in cement mortar of 1 is to 3 next is that 12 mm cement plaster 1 is to 3 with waterproofing compound laid above the plinth masonry with one or two thick coats of hot coal tar applied over the mortar after the mortar has fully dried dry sand should be sprinkled over the hot tar waterproofing compound in specified quantity can be used for waterproofing the mortar 40 to 50 mm thick cement concrete which is having the proportion of 1 is to 2 is to 4 two coats of asphalt or hot coal tar should be applied over the cement concrete when the concrete has been fully cured and dried mastic asphalt in one or two layers is generally considered best where hydraulic pressure is encountered the asphalt used should not melt or soften in hottest days and should not get squeezed out due to pressure of the masonry over it the damp proof core should be laid flush with the floor surface and should not be carried across doorways or other openings the upper layer of cement concrete floors 
should be continued over such openings and should be laid at the same time along the floors. The asphalt or tar layer should be laid under concrete at the opening. Where concrete is laid on bitumen or tar, the surface of the bitumen or tar must be sprinkled with dry sand. The position of the damp proof cores is also an important factor and it should be laid at such a height that it is above the normal level to which water splashes from the ground when it is raining. A damp proof course should not be less than 15 cm above the highest level of the ground. In northern India, plinths are usually capped 45 to 60 cm above ground level for good buildings under normal conditions. Now we move to treatment of floors. The floor should be laid on some dry filling. A hardcore filling of stones with smaller stones to fill in voids is quite suitable. The filling should be well rammed but not unduly consolidated. It is considered that a thin layer of cinders and coal tar well rammed under a tiled floor prevents the rise of dampness and efflorescence. A filling of 75 to 150 mm of dry coarse sand under the floor masonry is usually specified but this is suitable for dry locations only. Where there is a possibility of moisture penetrating the floor, it will be necessary to lay a liquid proof membrane before a concrete floor is laid. Now we move to treatment of walls. Rain can penetrate through solid brick walls as there is a limit to the amount of rain that a wall can keep out. Moisture is conveyed from the exterior to the interior due to the porosity of the bricks. More rapid penetration is through the mortar joints and an efficient pointing on the exterior will greatly resist the passage of water. The simple flush pointing will offer a good protection. Cavity walls afford sound protection and also ensure a dry interior even if porous material used for the outside. The application of a porous rendering or plaster on the exterior surface will do much to prevent direct penetration. A porous finish will absorb water in wet weather and will permit free evaporation when the weather improves. Whereas a dense impervious rendering or plaster is less efficient than a porous one as it will more effectively prevent moisture drying out rather than preventing it getting in and is also more liable to crack. An external treatment unless it is porous will also be liable to aggravate dampness if it is due to rising ground moisture, indirect penetration of rain, a mortar of cement, lime and sand in the proportion of 1 is to 2 is to 9 or 1 is to 1 is to 6 is usually recommended. Now we move to efflorescence. Where soluble salts are present in excessive quantities in bricks or in mortar, they absorb moisture either from the air or water during construction. These are brought to the surface in solution and deposited in concentrated patches either as a white powder or as translucent crystals as the moisture dries out. This crystalline growth either flakes off or is reduced to a powder which can be brushed off. Attempts to seal back efflorescence are not usually successful as it is advisable to allow the efflorescence to expand itself as the walls dry before attempting any treatment at rending or whitewashing the walls. Treatment at roofs. The presence of mass vegetation or other growth on roofs is direct evidence of a porous roofing material in which water will collect and will not be drained off. Overhanging trees will keep the roof wet and their fallen leaves will block the 
डाउन पाइप्स क्रैक्ड रूफिंग टाइल्स ब्रोक इन पॉइंटिंग आर कॉमन कॉजेज ऑफ लीकेज सीमेंट ग्राउट पोर्ड इन टू द ज्वाइंट एंड क्रैक इज वेरी हेल्पफुल इन सफिशियंट रूफ स्लोप और फ्लैट पिचेज विच आर टू स्लो टू ड्रेन ऑफ द रेन वाटर क्विकली आर ऑल्सो वन ऑफ मेन कॉजेज ऑफ लीकेज नाउ लेट सी रेन वाटर डाउन पाइप इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू प्रोवाइड सफिशियंट नंबर ऑफ डाउन पाइप एंड ऑफ एडिक्वेट साइज and it is more important to see quite often that they are not choked up all vertical pipe should be fixed to stand well clear of the walls so that if any cracks develop in the pipes or if there is a leakage in the joints the wall should not suffer any damage top of the down pipe should be very carefully and properly fixed with the roof outlets so that there is no overflowing of rain water or leakage through the walls the bottom end of the pipe should be so arranged that the water is not thrown back on the wall then ch chimney stacks defective or poorly executed junction of chimney stacks and roofs are a very common cause of leakage in sloping roofs a sufficient tuck of lead flashings into the chimney brickwork should be provided with cement fillets where necessary copings to parapet very important aspect the top of every wall not protected from the weather by a roof or overhanging eaves should be built as to prevent the penetration of rain water through the wall the top can be finished with one course of hard well burnt bricks set on edge in cement mortar over two courses of slates or dense tiles projecting over the wall so these are the remedial measures that we can take to prevent dampness from the building so here in this uh, lecture we discuss about the principles of damp proofing then procedure for damp proofing then detection of dampness then causes of dampness then prevention of dampness and finally we discuss about the remedial measures and treatment so i hope you must have enjoyed the discussion so go through the text and enrich your knowledge thank you